Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. And this week, we're going to be talking about patching. Woohoo! So patching is one of those things that is very, very basic that I feel like a lot of organizations are still struggling to do. And Adam and I, again, we talk to a lot of different customers, so we get a good sense of where a lot of people are. And this is just one of those basic things that is very, very important for security, yet we continually hear about companies in the news that are getting compromised due to unpatched operating systems, firewalls, whatever it is. And so we're going to talk about patching today and we're specifically just going to be focusing on windows, but a lot of these will apply to other operating systems like Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Linux, as well as applications like office and browsers um, and perhaps firewalls. You know, you should have a comprehensive vulnerability management program. But as far as trying to nail down Windows patching, which is probably going to be the majority of your infrastructure, maybe today, like you might have a lot of Linux as well as far as servers go, but your endpoints are most likely Windows, and then you probably have a good healthy number of Windows servers as well. So let's talk about that. One of the questions that... Adam and I sometimes get is, you know, for the other operating systems like Mac OS, Apple, like where should they be and how often are each particular version of operating systems still getting security updates? So like Mac OS is the current minus two. So if you're two operating systems back, you're still getting security updates. Apple and Android I would say you should always be current. So there's no reason to be current. And if you're not receiving security updates anymore on Android or or Apple, I would exclude them from accessing corporate data. And that's my opinion. You know, every company is different. But if you're not getting security updates, you're not getting patched for possible vulnerabilities that may be exploited in the wild. Yeah, totally agree. It, it's good call out that Mac OS is supported N minus two on versions. Uh, sometimes the the support model is a little more opaque with Apple. As an example, on iOS, for the first time this year, Apple allowed customers to stay on the previous version of iOS when the new one came out last fall. So we're talking like September 2021 and said, you can stay on the previous version of iOS. We'll keep patching it. And they did for a while. And then all of a sudden it was, oops, to get patches, now you need to update. And that's not really what people thought they were getting. They thought Apple was launching full minus one support for security patches on iOS. And it turns out it's more like minus a half, (laughs) where for maybe half the year you can defer going to the new version and still get security patches but certainly not long-term. So I think your guidance is correct on those mobile operating systems. You pretty much just need to stay current. Now that shouldn't be problematic unless you're holding it wrong because on those operating systems, every aspect of them is designed around the assumption that everything is current all of the time. Apps are always current. OS is always current. You have to like work (laughs) to have not current operating systems on those devices anymore. So if you're trying to apply this kind of like windows mindset to those devices, they're very, very different. You shouldn't do that. Um, So I think all overall good call outs there in those other platforms. And then for like firewalls and like Linux, I would also say those should be up to date all the time, right? make maintenance windows to do that because for firewalls specifically, they're not like giving you feature updates. They're patching security things. So if there's a patch for a firewall, like your network team should be prioritizing that. So your vulnerability management solution should be scanning those and making sure that you get up to date. Now let's talk about why we should be patching. 
there has been just an explosion of zero days in the last year. If you go back and look at the number of zero days that were being reported over a 10-year span, Mandiant had published this report that looked back for the last 10 years. And for example, in 2012, there were only two zero days discovered. And by zero day, we mean it's a vulnerability that has not been previously patched that was seen to be exploited or could be exploited in the wild. So in 2012, there were only two. In 2013, there were only three. In 2020, there were 30. But then all of a sudden in 2021, there were 80 of them. You know, so that was more than double of what had been previously seen in a single year. And Microsoft, Apple, and Google make up more than three quarters of the number of zero days, which makes sense because those are the platforms that are most actively being used. Primarily, they're state-sponsored groups that are the ones that are being seen exploiting these zero-day vulnerabilities with the Chinese being probably the more prevalent groups that are exploiting them. I would like to say that generally it's very unlikely that you're going to be a target of a zero day specifically. It does happen if you're like a high value target, but most likely for the majority of companies out there, you're not going to be a target of the zero day, but you may be a target of unpatched software because what happens after a zero day is reported, Microsoft, Apple, and Google will then patch the software. And if you leave it unpatched, now you are vulnerable to that particular CVE and there's going to be people scanning for those and they're going to attack you. So I wouldn't get all worked up about the zero day specifically, but this episode is mainly to kind of talk about, Hey, we should be continuously patching. This is something we need to focus on because as an industry, we're still struggling as a whole. So you should be working with your infrastructure teams and your cloud you know, engineers who are managing your, your cloud infrastructure to have a way to continuously patch. And for me, I suspect this number is just going to continue to get higher, like the number of zero days that are getting uh, reported. Because number one, I think a lot of this software is being built on legacy stuff, right? Like Windows has a lot of legacy code Mac OS has a lot of legacy code, even Google, like Android has been around for years. And so no one's writing this code from scratch. The engineers who are coming today, who are developing new features for these operating systems, I mean, they're importing code that they didn't write. And so there's going to be vulnerabilities discovered as well as, as people are writing new code, there's going to be vulnerabilities in that as well as we are getting better as an industry looking at code and finding vulnerabilities. So I just suspect that the number is just going to get higher. So again, more to just, we need to continually work on this process of patching. For those listening to the show and don't have the show notes in front of them, because I think we'll link to this Mandiant report and the, the chart. This chart looks like half of a parabola, <laughs> If you wanted that uh, Algebra 1 reference there, I, I mean, Andy said kind of the raw numbers, but we're talking like 21, 17, 18, okay, then a big jump, 32, and then a little drop, 30, and then 80. Like, you, you kind of have to see it to get it, but I mean, that's a 2.66x, you know, in growth year over year. Um, and I think, Andy, you called a lot of the reasons why. I'm always a fan of not trying to explain when something happens with like a single variable. Cause it's usually not that it's usually multiple things have changed over time that have led to that. And I, I think you touched on most, most of the things we could speculate on are causing this growth in zero days. Remember also that I always point out that once a zero days reported, like obviously the goal, I'm going to say something I've said on the show before is defect-free code, perfectly secure code. However, I think one of the most important things we can do because 
defects will happen and there will be zero days is how quickly can we respond to them? How quickly can we identify how broad that threat is in our environment? How quickly can we patch it? How quickly did the vendor patch it? How open were they about it? Those are all things we measure in this because it's not prevent it from happening, although that's a good goal. Really, our our focus should be as security practitioners is how do we get better at responding to these? Because Andy gave you a whole mess of reasons why these operating systems have code bases that are becoming more and more and more legacy. Some code in Windows goes back to 1985. I mean, it's coming up on its 40th birthday. Mac OS code is built on the Berkeley software distribution that dates back to the 60s and 70s and the birthplace of Unix. Um, Android is based on Linux, which is based on Unix. And so Linux came out in what, 91? So there's plenty of old code there. I mean, iOS iOS is code that dates all the way back to Next Step, which was created in the 1980s. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's incredible code bases here. And yes, a lot of that has been updated, but with the explosion of big tech and hiring more software engineers and software engineers writing code that, and updating code they might not be familiar with. And Anna, you didn't call this out as well, but with the pro- proliferation of cyber warfare as a tactic amongst nation states as well, there's just more and more incentive to find these and hoard these zero days as much as possible. So when zero days come out, that's good because then we know the nation states can't use it against us anymore. So a um, lot of reasons why. And again, I always kind of take the focus on instead of complaining about what's happening or trying to put the genie back in the bottle, I say, how can we learn to get better at dealing with this moving forward? So, what can we do about it? Well, there is an article that I'll link to. It's a tech community article about different Windows update policies that you should configure. And then then that's from a an on-prem mentality. There's also another one that's written by a Microsoft MVP that talks about some Intune policies. And so we'll talk about both. But before we get started, you know, I will mention this again because I, I talked about it last week, but there is sometimes this n- mentality within IT organizations that can be adverse to change, right? And I think that is sometimes the difference between general IT administrators and security practitioners and administrators where sometimes the IT admins will have this if it ain't broke, don't fix it type mentality. Keep the lights on. Let's not make any waves. But I truly believe that good security practitioners are always looking for ways to improve security. And that means reevaluating things that are basic that we may be able to make incremental change to. And even incremental change is good. So if you're making improvement anywhere to the security that's a good thing, no matter how big or small it is. You don't have to make a big splash and, and make this huge, you know, implement this huge new product or anything like that. Like you could just look at your patching process and see how well you're doing that. Like, are you 99.9% patched in your Windows environment? And if you are, awesome. You are among the 1% out there. I will tell you that. So, Automation is probably one of the biggest things that has been an improvement to modernize patching. There are solutions out there today in cloud infrastructure. So if you're hosting servers in different cloud providers like Azure, AWS, GCP, each one of them, I know for sure AWS and Azure, I'm not sure about GCP, but for sure AWS and Azure have automation solutions that you can buy natively through them and automate patching. So for Azure, and I'll speak to Azure because I'm familiar with Azure, there's patch automation that's built into number one, all Azure native servers. So you could just have that be the solution. And I would highly recommend for non-critical servers for you to do that as well as you can extend 
third-party cloud servers or on-prem servers into Azure management to do the same thing using technology like Azure Arc. So if you host servers within AWS and you don't want to buy their automated solutions because you have you know, multiple cloud solutions or multiple cloud hosting, you can have a single pane of glass with one single uh, policy to automate everything. And maybe you, you don't want to you know, shift them over and that's okay. You have redundancy, but at least like your automation and your patching is under one umbrella then. And so Azure Arc is a really cool technology if you haven't heard about it or seen it because it allows you to extend management and Azure policy and patch automation and visibility for on-prem servers and third-party cloud like AWS, GCP, Alibaba, whatever other cloud solutions are out there into Azure. And it sees it as like an Azure machine even though it's not physically located in Azure. So that's something that you can take a look at because automation will make everything much easier. I'll tell you, for one, I have a lab that I use for learning. And as I have been spinning up servers, I started getting more and more servers. Currently, I'm sitting at seven servers and at least four Windows endpoints. The endpoints are being patched through policy through my endpoint management, but my servers, I went ahead and extended those into Azure Arc and just automated the patching because even at seven servers, I don't have time to log into seven servers and reboot them and patch them. I I don't want to do that. So I just automated it and I never have to look at it except for in the management portal and I see green check marks and everything's up to date. All the security patches are, are good to go. Now, sometimes I'll go in there and do the optional ones, but that is optional, right? The security ones are automatically patched. So that makes a huge difference for quality of time being spent doing something menial. Azure Arc is really, really cool. And it is free. F-R-E-E free. And by the way, I often will say when I'm talking to customers and they'll be like, is that free? And I'll say, no, it's not free. It's included because, you know, if you're paying for something, calling something that you get with what you pay for as free is kind of disingenuous. Azure Arc is legitimately free. Anybody listening to this show right now can go spin up an Azure tenant. You can onboard devices into Azure Arc, regardless of where they sit on prem AWS, GCP, Oracle Cloud, anywhere, and you get them in that single pane of glass under the Azure Management UI, you get cloud security posture management so you can see, like, does this device have RDP wide open or other misconfigurations? That is completely free too. So this is really cool stuff and a real differentiator, um, something that's relatively unique to Azure. So it's it's really worth checking out. Um, j- just for our, our listeners that are trying to kind of wrap their arms around this, this management um, and get that visibility and get that control and be able to do it at scale. Uh, it's really, really cool. And it's totally free. So big, big plug for Azure Arc. And by the way, uh, former guest of the Blue Security Podcast, John Joyner, literally wrote the book on Azure Arc. So if you want to know more, um, go to the, wherever you like to buy books and look up John's uh, work because it's awesome. I think another thing that has traditionally been difficult for IT admins to wrap their head around is separating out the different devices into different policies for updating. If you treat everything the same, then I think you're going to run into a difficult time because some machines can't be rebooted. Some uh, should be rebooted. Some might involve some user interaction And so there should be different categories of policies applied to different types of devices. And I'll just go over just an example of a few, but for example, like single user devices, right? Endpoints that are issued like, like Adam's laptop or my laptop, there should be fewer disruptions during the workday and you don't want them to be rebooted. Like during a presentation that will make users unhappy, right? If I'm, (laughs) trying to do a presentation or meeting and all of a sudden my my system reboots 
you know, security guys rebooting my machine, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you want all the data to be saved. You, you don't want to, you have, you know, uh, anything wiped. And you want, some users may want a level of control to be able to defer, you know, updates at, to a point that when they can do that. And sometimes you want devices to meet a certain compliance policy. So endpoints that are assigned to users, very, very different, right? Multi-user devices, you should have few to no notifications because if it's multi-user, you know, most of the time they're not doing like a meeting or something like that. It's probably something on like a shop floor. Um, You probably don't want to have any type of uh, reboots like when it's being used. So you know, make sure that uh, you're not doing automatic reboots End users shouldn't be able to schedule it or defer it, right? Because it is a shared device. So you should be completely under management. So you should be able to schedule when that device is going to reboot during non-production hours. Now, sometimes there are companies that have 24-7 operations. I get that. And they're like, we cannot take our machines down. Like, if it's a critical machine to production, you know, I mean, if it's life safety, I would say probably, you know, you you definitely want to manually do that at a certain point. But in today's world, you cannot not have a maintenance window. Essentially, you must have at some point a maintenance window to do updates that that's you have to put your foot down as a security professional because not doing updates is, is not an option, right? So whether they bring it down for an hour to do updates or whenever it is, it has to be scheduled. You have to do it. Um, We've talked about on this show too, that one of the skills we all have to get better at is being able to truly articulate risk but not in a way where the sky is falling. And I think that's been the problem of, of security professionals in the past. And I think that's the problem with other fields that try really, really hard to warn people of danger is sometimes we get too hung up on overstating the risk or we don't articulate it well enough what the risks actually are. And then we, we don't get that buy-in. So I think of meteorolo- meteorology. Uh, as an example, where they try to articulate the risk of severe weather. And because it feels like sometimes alarmist, you know, in the Midwest, there's often people who joke like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what I do in a tornado warning, go sit out front of my house on my deck and watch. Um, and that that's because they have been kind of numbed to reports that there's a tornado warning, there's a severe thunderstorm warning, and they don't see a serious enough impact from it. So, you know, there's opportunities to get better at that. I think of, um, not to pick on a very sore subject here, but public health. Um, I I think that has been really challenging, balancing risk mitigation against people's desire for uh, normalcy. Um, And and so there, there are challenges in any field where you are trying to articulate risk to a group that's not in your business and to do it in a way that gets their attention but doesn't hurt your reputation as a truth teller, as someone who they can be trusted to say, this is important enough to do. And here's why you should do this, even though there are these downsides to it. That's, that's a really tough thing to do. And don't feel bad if you're not good at that, because as I just mentioned, there's plenty of professionals who deal with the general public who struggle with it. And we have seen it, in this country for the past two plus years on some of those challenges as well. So this is really, really hard, but hopefully if we're doing our jobs really well and really effectively, this business will say, okay, I get it. We're going to take that system down for maintenance, you know, once a month at 3 AM on the first Tuesday of the month. And that is worth doing because if we don't do that, there'll be this OT attack and it will take it down for weeks and we'll lose way more money than we will for taking it down uh, 12 hours a year for maintenance and patching. 
right? That's the win you want to get to. So kind of think of where you're trying to get to and then make your plans accordingly. Yeah. And there are other ways to mitigate against this, right? Because I'm just thinking about Adam, you said OT and you know, we're going to have OT devices and SCADA devices that are running embedded windows XP embedded windows seven. I mean, like there are systems out there and there will continue to be systems out there probably before I retire, Mm -hmm. you know, that are going to be continually run these operating systems because you can't update them. Mm -hmm. So there are other ways to mitigate against that. Like, having them on, you know, seg- segmented VLAN with ACLs and, you know, doing other security controls around it, right? And, and we're not talking about that. We're talking about modern Windows devices. So in these situations, you do want to patch them, right? If they're exposed to the internet, and even if they aren't, I mean, consider that because in a zero trust in- environment, you're assuming the attacker has access to your network, right? And so even if it's not on the internet, which, you know, it's very hard to believe in these days that you have endpoints that aren't talking to the internet because most people at least like browse YouTube or whatever while they're working, right? Even in a shared environment. So these type of machines are the ones we're talking about. These are the ones that you need to maintain and patch. Another thing that Microsoft has recommended for a long time is to move away from WSUS as a patching solution and move to Windows Update for Business. Now, WSUS is a fairly legacy solution where IT admins are controlling the patches and when and where and how the users are patched. And they're usually downloaded onto distribution points and sent out through like a vehicle like SCCM to those endpoints. Now, there's a lot of reasons why people might still like this, but I'll give you a couple ones that you probably don't need it anymore. Number one, and the biggest one here is you're no longer patching individual KBs. Like back in the day, admins used to pick which KBs to update But Microsoft long ago got rid of all that. Now we just do monthly quality updates with all the security updates roll into one. And so you're no longer picking. You just get the Microsoft update, right? And so all you're doing is picking when the users are getting that nowadays. So you might as well move to Windows Update for Business and get away from patching it on-prem because as well as users will have to connect to your internal infrastructure, to get those updates if you're controlling it through WSUS. And, you know, Adam and I, we often think it's crazy to continue to require users to connect to on-prem infrastructure to get something like patching, Mm -hmm. right? Now, you can get a little bit more modern if you're still using WSUS with, like, the cloud management gateway, which we talked about with Shannon Fritz on our Windows device management episode. And this allows you to at least connect to SCCM through the cloud and as well as get updates through those means for application delivery and all of that. So you don't need to have a VPN connection. This cloud management gateway will connect for you to your on-prem SCCM environment only. And so that's one way to get modern. But I would recommend going to Windows Update for Business. Now, some businesses do shy away from this because they think, oh, all these users are going to be pulling updates from our internet pipe, which can be an issue because maybe your internet pipe at your company is only 300 megabits, you know, down or something like that. And then all these users on patch Tuesday are going to be pulling the updates from the internet itself and not your internal LAN. You can configure other things like delivery optimization and you know and be able to get those bits from other machines on the LAN you can segment it to only a specific subnet so there are ways to optimize that or just get a bigger pipe right (laughs) but as well as a lot of users are at home now right so they're using their internet at home so you know if you're requiring them to connect to VPN to get an update from WSUS now you're clogging up your VPN pipeline right Mm. so again Move to Windows Update for Business as soon as you can. 
if you're still using something like WSUS. I, I'm amazed at how much pushback I get whenever I bring this up. This this surprises me. And I mentioned earlier on the show, like, again, I don't have that infrastructure experience, right? So I don't get the challenges with this sometimes. But this to me feels like, again, my armchair quarterback perspective, that this is like holding on just to hold on, like holding on just for control or just for career stability or whatever reason you come up with, it doesn't feel like it's the right thing to do anymore because this is such a simple way to deliver patches to your end users. And again, Andy, you kind of touched on some of the end use cases where this still doesn't work, but for most use cases, you define these deployment rings you know, we're going to deploy it to this users at this time and, and these users a couple of days later and these users a couple of days later. If you don't have those rings set up, now is a good time to do that because there's a lot of models that leverage that today where we have kind of our alpha users. They're IT, super technical. If we break stuff, they're fine rebuilding their laptop. You know, whatever, we don't care. And then you've kind of got the rest of IT. They're technical enough. They know how to talk to the help desk. Like we can get some telemetry there. Then you've got your super users and they're like your tech friendly people who live in the business uh, and they're still kind of a friend of IT and they'll give you the feedback. And now you can start to test against all those disparate applications across your environment. And then finally you deploy to everyone else. And you can do this over a course of a, just a couple of days and if you start getting feedback that something's not right, you can hit the stop button and stop deploying it further until you figure out what's going on. Like you don't need to babysit this stuff anymore. You don't need to micromanage this stuff anymore. And you don't want to deliver this over your own pipe and over your own intranet. There's no reason to do that today. Again, unless you're in like a very, very, very bandwidth starved environment which I get there are examples of that retail. Sometimes it's a good one, especially if you have retail in small markets where there just isn't a lot of good broadband options. Okay, been there, get it. Um, but otherwise, like maybe factory sites again, you know, in, in very rural communities where there's not good bandwidth. Okay, fine. But for the most part, like we always say on this show, don't let the fact that you can't deploy something universally, stop you from deploying it somewhere. If you could deploy Windows Update for business for like the majority of your, and I hate both of these terms, like information workers or knowledge workers, people who sit at a desk, you know, all day, that's a great place to start. That's still probably the majority of your business, right? Or the majority of your risk. So look at windows update for business, please. And maybe somebody can send us some feedback on why there's so much pushback on it. But if it's not just like, well, I want to control what we're doing, or I need to approve every KB individually, or I just like control, like fine, fine, sure, whatever. But for the most part, I haven't heard a lot of really good arguments to not do this. And this is something, by the way, I get that your company is not Microsoft and can't be. This is how Microsoft functions today. 200,000 employees, you know, endpoints distributed around the globe. We're on Windows Update for Business. My Surface Surface Book 3, you know, pulls everything from Windows Update. Drivers, firmware even, and automatically just installs it when it's supposed to. And I get very user-friendly messages about like, hey, by the way, we just installed some patches. We need you to do a reboot in a couple days here. Uh, we know you're working right now, so we'll do this after hours, or you can schedule it. Like, that's totally cool, and it's great user experience. And by the way, security professionals, pretty awesome that my laptop has firmware updates, driver updates, everything is completely up to date. Like my attack surface is very, very low on my device when I've got those green check marks across the board and everything is patched. Yeah, and so you can configure a Windows Update for Business through SCCM. You can do it through Intune. I would highly recommend moving to a co-management type deployment if you're still on-prem and offloading that slider from SCCM to Intune to take this workload. That's usually one of the first workloads that 
IT orgs will move from SCCM to Intune as part of a co-management solution. So very easy to configure in Intune to do that. Um, the final thing that I wanted to talk about is a new feature that we announced. And just to dive in a little bit for our listeners, if you haven't heard this, but there's a new feature that's going to be called Windows Auto Patch. And it's part of M365 E3. So if you're an E3 licensed or above customer, you're going to get this at no additional cost. So there was some FUD out there that kind of talked about <laughs> possibly Patch Tuesday going away because of this new auto patch. That is not true. So if you read that somewhere or there's some article that kind of alluded to that as clickbait and you were like, oh, Patch Tuesday is going away. That's not true. We're still having Patch Tuesday. Patch Tuesday will still be a thing. But this new auto patch will essentially, the, the marketing term that some of these articles said is Patch Tuesday will just be another Tuesday for folks who are using this because you're not having to worry about patching anymore. And so Windows Auto Patch is basically offloading the planning and operations of Windows and M365 update, update processes from your org to Microsoft. So Microsoft will do that as a service for you to plan and help you scope these policies. You're still going to have to monitor the patches and how they you know, get the feedback from the users, but there'll be a big pause button if you need to. So it's not like you're not involved at all, because if there are issues, your users are going to have to talk to the IT admins. But as part of the planning and scoping and making sure that patching is happening, this is going to be a service that's going to be offered to our ME3 customers at no additional cost. It is in preview now. It is expected to go uh, GA in July of 2022. For the commercial cloud, if you are a GCC uh, government cloud or GCC high, it is not going to be supported at this time a couple of prereqs for it you do need to be on intune azure ad join devices or co-managed devices in order to do this domain join only machines will not be supported you don't have to re-image or reset any devices in order to take advantage of the service so that's important as well and then windows server and multi-session windows like abd are not going to be supported at this time but windows 365 is going to be supported. So the the main difference, you know, some some people have asked because we talked about this Windows update for business, what's the main difference of that versus Windows Auto Patch? And it's the planning and scoping of these rings. You know, if you just don't have enough time to look at it and figure it out and do the planning for it, Microsoft is going to help you as a service to do this. This was funny. Andy and I were actually in a customer meeting and a customer said, Hey, I heard patch Tuesday's going away. And Andy and I kind of both look at each other like, uh, I haven't heard that. <laughs> and it turns out that's, that's where we were able to figure it out. It was the clickbaity headline. Um, and they meant well, it was just, it was kind of a joke about, Hey, you know, with windows auto patch, uh, patch Tuesday's just another Tuesday, which is actually kind of a clever little line. Our marketing people should steal that. Uh, this this is cool stuff. This actually grew, um, by the way, just a little inside baseball. If you're familiar with this concept of the Microsoft Managed Desktop, which is like full on, basically, Microsoft manages your whole device end to end. Um, this is a subset of that. So this is just patch management. Uh, Microsoft does your patch management for you. So basically, Windows Update for Business as a service. Uh, if that makes sense to anyone listening or not. Uh, so the cool stuff, you know, if, if this is, again, especially if you're a smaller shop and you just don't have time to put this on your plate as well, this lets you get to that Windows Update for Business goodness without a whole heck of a lot of effort. And I do like that this rewards customers that are, um, you know, kind of being forward thinking about their device management. So you have to be in at least a co-managed state. So that is your configuration manager plus Intune type of model. Uh, you have to be at least hybrid Azure AD joined um, to utilize this model. So you can't just be, you know, old fashioned domain join. You can be domain join plus more and that's okay. So this is cool stuff. Um, 
not not out yet. Like Andy said, generally available this summer. So check out the show notes if you're curious and want to learn more. I think for enterprises, I, I think there'll be less adoption of this. I think for smaller enterprises, especially small and medium commercial uh, business, I think there'll be a lot of interest there as well. There should be. I, I've i said it before on the show and I'll say it again. I continue to believe that the greatest area of opportunity to improve security posture is going to be in small and medium business. I think there's, there's a lot of... Um, folks who run those kind of organizations who want to be secure, but obviously can't even afford to hire a cybersecurity professional, let alone a whole team. You know, they have like an IT guy and all he's, he, him or her is doing is trying to keep the lights on. So this is a great offer, especially for, for somebody like um, those, those size of businesses. So hopefully we, kind of gave you some thoughts to think about on patch management and taking a look at, you know, how your organization is doing that. It's always good to go back and review. That's our show for this week. Thanks as always for watching and listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions or topics you guys want us to talk about, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.